We are live, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nilesh. On behalf of Indian Society for Veterinary Medicine, I welcome you all for today's webinar. I request General Secretary of Indian Society for Veterinary Medicine, Dr. Ram Prabhu, sir, to brief about the webinar. Ram Prabhu, sir, please. Okay, thank you, Dr. Galdar. It is my honor to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Ramesh Silvaraj, Aluminium Canvas. He had a vast experience in poultry research and he has readily accepted our invitation to deliver the guest lecture for our members of ISVM as well as the PG and UG students of the colleges in India. So, I am Thankful to Dr. Ramesh Kaloraj for accepting our invitation to deliver the lecture on probiotic supplementation and to increase intestinal pathogen loads in poultry. So it is of very economic, the property is of very economic importance, particularly in the poultry wells of India. So, on behalf of the participants and ISVM, I welcome Dr. Ramesh Kaloraj for the webinar. Thank you. And I also welcome all the participants to the program. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Before uh, starting the webinar, I would like to introduce about today's speaker. Today we have Dr. Ramesh Salvaraj, sir, with us for delivering the webinar. Dr. Ramesh Salvaraj completed his DVM and MS degree from Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, second MS degree from Orito State University, and his PhD degree from University of California, Delhi. After postdoctoral research associateship at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital at USA, he joined the Ohio State University as an assistant professor in year 2007. He later joined University of Georgia in year 2017. Dr. Chalora's laboratory is the first laboratory ever to identify and characterize chicken tea regulatory cells, tea regulatory cells are a subset of T cells specializing in immune, immune suppression and are involved in microbial defense, pathogen persistence, impaired vaccine response, and compromise, compromised anti-tumor response. Dr. Saloraj Laboratory made monoclonal anti-chicken CD25. Dr. Saloraj holds a patent for non uh, nanoparticulate vaccine for salmonella antigen. Dr. Saloraj has published approximately 40 ref referred papers. He teaches nutritional immunology in animal system to graduate and undergraduate at University of Georgia. He is also serving as an associate editor of poultry science or health and diseases and frequently reviews manuscript for, the, for other journals in his specialized area. Such an eminent speaker is with us. I welcome and request Dr. Salora sir to de deliver his webinar, please. Dr. Salora sir, please. Thank you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay, I hope uh, everyone is able to see my screen. And if not, let me know, and everyone should be able to hear me clearly, hopefully. I, you know, at least if you are having any trouble uh, and you are not able to reach me, just send a message to my cell. I should be able to see that and try to fix it. And first, thanks for coming to my seminar. My name is Ramesh Salvaraj. I'm a faculty in poultry science at University of Georgia. And uh, as I said earlier, I went to Madras Veterinary College and while I was there, I got to know one of the, got to know your general secretary, Dr. Ramesh. We are like very, very good friends. And I was very excited when he asked me if I could give a seminar. Uh, so excited, uh, except that uh, because of the COVID, I have not been in my office in the last six months. All I do is get my salary and that's it. And every day is a Sunday for me and I lost track of what day of the week it is. So yesterday when Dr. Sindhu called me to set up the seminar, 
I was like, let's do it tomorrow. I thought it was Thursday. And he said, no, 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 it's Friday already. It was embarrassing, I can tell you that. Then I had to rush to put the slides and here I am. And I'm going to be uh, talking about the probiotic supplementation to decrease uh, our intestinal pathogen loads uh, in uh, poultry. Currently, there are three major issues in the poultry industry, at least in the US. The number one is coxy, coccidiosis, which is caused by Imeria protozoa. But as Imeria, Imeria starts to proliferate, the pathogen induced damage causes an another bacteria, Clostridium perfringens, to proliferate and the toxin produced by Clostridium perfringens causes damage and eventually we end up having necrotic enteritis. So this is, you know, Coxy and necrotic enteritis are the biggest problem right now. And then we have Salmonella, foodborne pathogens like Salmonella, Campylobacter, and they cause problem to the poultry industry. There are several challenges to control an intestinal pathogen. In fact, as an immunologist, it is pretty embarrassing for me that we are not able to control these pathogens in poultry. Human immunologists look at people like me, poultry immunologists, and think we are idiots who don't know the solution. You cannot find a solution because we don't know the subject. But it is not as simple as you would think it is. One of the problems of controlling an intestinal pathogen is it is there are more than multiple therawars to be controlling this in involved uh, that are more than one one therawars in in that cause the disease in this sir, sir, sir sorry to disturb just interrupt uh -huh. uh, voice is not uh, clearly audible sir uh, is it possible uh -huh, yes sir Okay, let me see whether this helps you. It does it help you, or I can try my. Uh, is it clear? Hi, it's clear right now, sir. Okay, let me maybe uh, come a little bit closer. I was kind of uh, uh, leaning back on my. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Challenges to control the uh, intestinal pathogen as an immunologist. It's pretty embarrassing that I'm not able to do that. But the problem is. There are multiple therawars of the same pathogen. For example, Salmonella has over 200 therawars. And if I design an antibiotic or a vaccine to control, let me say Salmonella enteritis, and I'm successful in doing that, some other therawar starts to come up, like Salmonella Heidelberg. And then there is this problem of poultry or livestock acting as a carrier of this foodborne pathogen. Carrier meaning they don't know that they don't show the symptoms of the disease. To be fair, when I started teaching at US, I used to tell that, hey, do you know back in India, we never have the problem of foodborne pathogens like Salmonella and Campylobacter in poultry. And I asked, do you know why? Not that those both don't have that. Thing is, my mom will nuke the meat, meaning she will cook it so much. And but here in US, it is pretty common. For example, when I have seen people ordering steak, which is beef steak, bloody, which means that they want a pink color in the center, meaning that they're pretty uncooked meat. It's pretty common to see people eating that. And here they are eating uncooked food, and if they get a foodborne pathogen, you know who they want to comply? Not themselves, but rather they want to go and comply the chicken producer who produced the meat, that they have produced the meat with salmonella. They don't want to take a blame that they didn't cook the meat properly. And And the chicken producer does not even have, is not even aware that it has the infection to start with. 
and then we don't have a very good vaccine. The problem, there are lots of problem of designing a vaccine against uh, intestinal pathogen and don't want to go into it. And then we used to have a solution, antibiotic. We were able to control these foodborne pathogens by using antibiotics. And then we had this uh, veterinary feed directive. It is not a law, but it's kind of a law that was put in 2014. And now I cannot add any antibiotic. I can, but adding an antibiotic makes my life miserable. So I almost stopped using antibiotic. So probiotics are live microbial feed supplements that have beneficial effects on the host by improving the intestinal microbial balance. In fact, the Russian Nobel Prize winner, Kalimachinkov, was the first one who conceptualized the term probiotics. And in 1907, he proposed that acid-producing bacteria in fermented milk products could prevent fouling in the large intestine and if consumed regularly, can lead to longer and healthier life. There are tons of probiotics available for human consumption, not for poultry. Uh, the other name for probiotics, you will see that as direct friend microbials, yogurt, kevir, miso, kombucha, cheese, million other products. But even you know, like for you, you might think they are all probiotics, they may be. But to be honest, they are not really probiotics. I'll come to that in the next slide. Um, because most of the probiotics, the microorganisms, as you consume them, they will be destroyed in your gastric, your, in your stomach. The gastric pH will destroy the probiotic. So to be honest, when you eat yogurt as a probiotic source, most likely you are consuming yogurt as a protein supplement rather than a probiotic supplement because most of the bacteria are curled. So what we do is normally is we take those you know, probiotics, convert them into spores or what we do is we have certain coat uh, chemist, chemist did that, we protect those bacteria with certain entry coating so that they will survive the gut. So if you are to use the spores, they are resistant to gastric acid and they can correlate at the later part, lower part of the intestine. And most importantly, they are stable at the room temperature. Normally, when we use probiotic, we use the word quality a few a lot. They stand for colony forming units and each colony represent one probiotic. So do you know which is the biggest organ in our body? These days, they consider the gut microbiota to be an organ by itself. So for you to, somebody to use the probiotics, we better understand the gut microbiota. The gut is colonized by one to the one, like 10 to the power of 14, that is one, 14 zeros after one. That's a huge population. 30 to 40 species comprise uh, the 99% of the population. Okay. So now you should start to understand the problem of using the probiotic. Let me give you this example. Okay. Let me say that I take you guys and leave you in the Amazon jungle with your girlfriend. Okay. Not your wife, with your girlfriend. Okay. And then tell you, hey guys, go, I'll come back after 30 years and see whether you have populated the Amazon jungle, right? It's not going to happen, I can guarantee you that. I don't think you will survive the first night, the tiger is going to eat you, you know, you're done. The intestine is much, much worse than that. Any probiotic you are going to give is not going to survive the Amazon jungle in the gut. So you need to be aware of that, this fact that you end up feeding probiotic continuously, okay? So, but it also makes me ask a question, why did we evolve to have the gut microbes? For example, if the same microbe 
tries to get into the blood system, we are going to fight tooth and nail to eliminate this gut microbiota. On the other hand, we evolved to co-live with the same microbiota in the gut. So what is the evolutionary force that drove us to co-live with the microbes? It turns out these microbes can salvage energy that are otherwise non-digestible to the host. So the point is you need to find a probiotic that can benefit the host. If not, the host will throw the bacteria out. I can guarantee you that. So we, in probiotic field, we use this concept called as colonization resistant that it is extremely difficult to change the current population of gut microbiota. This is one of the reasons you will see that probiotics have to be fed continuously. You will think normally that probiotics are live bacteria and I need to dig, let me, somebody is annotating, okay. Uh, this is, uh, you will think that the probiotics are live bacteria and all you need to do is feed them once, right? And this population can replenish itself because they are live. No, we, are, we have seen over and over again that you, once you stop feeding the probiotics, uh, their population will disappear. And also, and also, you stop feeding the probiotics, their population will disappear. And also you need a huge dose. You are talking about 10 to the power of 9 or 10 to the power of 8. That's a lot. And we need such a high dose to achieve a successful colonization. The intestine is sterile at birth and get progressively colonized by a complex consortium of microorganisms. Keep in mind, genetics do determine the microbial population, but it's only very little. It's your environment and the seeder population that determines the eventual microbial population. It's a huge implication because the environmental factors that can determine the seeders are going to be so different. For example, if you are going to use an antibiotics in your chicken feed, when does the chick hatch in the hatchery and when does it feed the food? Uh, milk or colostrum replaces in animal production. Whether I'm going to reuse my litter or I'm going to use a fresh litter. Whether the birds are being raised in cages or in community. What is the diet of the food? Whether the birds are having any stress. Whether I'm using a chlorinated water or not. So these are all going to affect what kind of probiotics you need to use that uh, will uh, affect the cedar population. I don't want any of you thinking that bad bacteria are present only if you have a disease. I can guarantee you right now that each and every one of you are carrying Salmonella or Campylobacter or other nasty bugs in your gut. I can guarantee you that. But the good thing is, your body keeps it under control. Dysbiosis is a situation where the pathogenic bacteria overtake the good bacteria. Here is uh, good, bad and ugly. And for those who don't know that, uh, good, bad and ugly is the name of a famous Hollywood movie. So I use this uh, uh, name a lot. Uh, the good one or the lactobacillus uh, here the lactobacillus u bacteria and bifidobacteria they can inhibit the growth of exogenous or harmful bacteria uh, they can stimulate the immune function they can aid in the digestion of the uh, digestion and the absorption of the food they can synthesize the vitamin and then we have groups like bacteroides which can have health benefits but they can have pathogenic effects too and then we have Staphylococcus, Clostridium, they have lot, they can produce lot of harmful effect, they are pathogenic, they can cause diarrhea, they can cause cancer, uh, they can produce cartilogens, intestinal putrefaction.
So when you want to choose a bacteria, make sure as a probiotic, when you choose a probiotic, not just bacteria, I'll come to that in a minute, make sure they have this following characteristics. Be of the host origin. This is a big problem. It used to be a big problem because poultry industry were literally using those probiotics that were isolated from humans. Obviously, they should not be fat, non pathogenic. They should withstand processing and storage. Think of that. What happens in the poultry industry? We pellet our food. They should obviously be resisting, resistant to gastric acid and bile. They should adhere to the epithelium or uh, the mucus. They should persist in the intestinal tract. They should produce uh, inhibitory compounds. So when it comes to uh, probiotics, uh, these are the biggest players. Lactobacillus acidophilus. They are primarily found in the small intestine, uh, vagina in terms of humans, uh, cervix and urethra. They, produces nat they produce natural antibiotics like lactosidine, acidophilin. They produce acidic pH. They generally colonize the upper part of the intestine. Uh, bifidobacterium, uh, they are in the large intestine and they can digest lactose. They can ferment in this digestible fibers and produce energy uh, which can be used by the host. Uh, they can colonize the lower part of the intestine. Uh, recently, I'm seeing a lot of lactobacillus rhamnoses. Uh, Bifidobacterium brevet is being promoted for certain inflammatory bubble disease, not in poultry, but I thought I'll give you a brief background. And also keep in mind, it's not just bacteria. Saccharomyces boulardii uh, is a yeast uh, and it has been used as a probiotic all the time. Every company I know of, this is all human, but same with poultry industry. There's a joke in US that if you are a poultry supplement producing guy, if you don't have a probiotic in your uh, catalog, you are not a poultry producing, supplementing producing company. That's how many people are in the market. Everybody is producing uh, poultry, you know, probiotics. Uh, I am a nutritionist. As far as I could tell you, of, I cannot think of one nutritionist, a poultry nutritionist, who does not use a probiotic in USA. Everybody, they be use a, a probiotic. There are several uh, commercially available uh, probiotics. What are the mechanisms? There are several mechanisms through which probiotics can help you. Uh, they can uh, inhibit the production of, uh, uh, they can inhibit the pathogen adversion. They can enhance the epithelial barrier, meaning uh, the tight junction in uh, tight junctions or the one in, the, in your gut or the one that keeps the gut as a gut, meaning that there's no free flow of uh, products from one side of the gut to the other gut and uh, Probiotics helps in maintaining the tight junctions. Uh, they produce antimicrobial substance like uh, short my antimicrobial peptides uh, to decrease the proliferation of some of the pathogenic microorganisms. Uh, and they can stimulate the immune response. Uh, they produce uh, uh, interleukin 10, which can suppress the immune response. Uh, they can induce T-regulatory cells, which I worked a lot, and which can help you to uh, stimulate the immune response. So what are some of the functions of probiotics? They can block the attachment of pathogen. pathogen. They can compete with the pathogen for nutrients. They produce antimicrobial compounds. Uh, they produce, uh, they can bind certain mycotoxins, uh, they can stimulate IgA production, uh, they form thick layer to fortify the intestinal barrier, they can develop the immune system, uh, tighten the tight junctions, uh, they can stimulate epic.
the success of any particular strain to colonize the intestine or bind the pathogen depends on the particular strain and what region you are trying to target. For example, Salmonella is a big problem in the Zika, while Clostridium perfringens is a big problem in the jejunum, a different part of the intestine. So the probiotics that control Salmonella may not work for Clostridium. But if you are a probiotic making company, your product should ideally combat more than one population, right? You don't want to be just selling for Salmonella. So that is the reason you will see that most commercially available probiotic has more than one strain. In fact, it is pretty common to see around four to five strains of bacteria in any commercially available probiotic uh, mix. Okay. Now that uh, I have talked about, I'm going to come back uh, to recap. Uh, these are the major intestinal pathogens of interest in poultry, Salmonella, Campylobacter, uh, million serovars for each of them, and Clostridium perfringens. Okay. So how to control these pathogens? So as I said earlier, there is no one solution. We have multiple approaches. Uh, feed additives is a big one where we use probiotics, prebiotics, organic acids, we use vaccines. So that's maybe how we control. And my lab is going to work a lot on developing uh, probiotics to counter gut pathogens. Uh, we developed the standard operating procedure how to choose the probiotics. I work with companies in identifying the right probiotic strains that can uh, decrease uh, the gut pathogen load in poultry. Okay, so if you want to develop a probiotic, a good model, first rule, having multiple species in a product is the norm, okay? Thousands of options are available. Each and every company comes up with their own product. But the problem is, if you go and ask them, hey, do you know whether your probiotic survives the gut and colonize the intestine? Believe me or not, no one knows how to measure it. And then does it have a probiotic properties? And does the probiotic target the general health, keeping to keep the both healthy, or one pathogen like Salmonella, or multiple pathogens like Salmonella, Clostridium, Campylobacter, or all of the above. So this is what we do in my lab. So what we do is for us, you know, like does the probiotic survive? So what we do is uh, we look at whether these uh, uh, probiotics can solve, can survive the bilateral supplementation. So in this case, we had four, four different strains of that probiotics, uh, Lactobacterus deuteri, Acidolacticine, PCM, and Animalis. And obviously, bilateral supplementation had a biphasic effect. Here, I'm talking about the first one, biphasic effects, that uh, by supplementation at up to 1% increased, while supplementation at 1.5 and 2% decreased the uteri uh, proliferation. The ability of the probiotic uh, strains to hydrolyze bile salts uh, through bile salt <laughs> provides a competitive advantage for the probiotic species to survive and colonize the gut. Uh, all of them, lactobacillus, uh, the acidolacti, uh, eubacterium PCM, enterobacterium PCM, and uh, bifidobacterium animalis, all of them uh, uh, they express this particular enzyme, and obviously they were able to survive the uh, bile. The pH of the in the various section of the gut varies widely and ranges between one and seven and the survival of the probiotic strain is dependent on its ability to withstand a wide range of pH. Uh, PCM proliferation increased with decreasing pH. Enterococci are relatively resistant to uh, those one the enterococci are relatively resistant to gastric conditions compared to the other uh, bacterial species. 
Uh, in fact, 40% of them survived for the first 60 minutes in THN2. Uh, we found that. And the lactobacillus futuri, they were uh, really, really uh, resistant to low pH. Obviously, they are acid producing enzyme and they can handle some uh, enzyme. And then once we do that, we would screen these probiotics to see whether they have any, uh, they have uh, effect to supplement, effect to inhibit the proliferation of pathogenic microorganism. The first thing we do it is we start in vitro and then we would move in vivo. It is not rocket science, a simple experiment. What we do is basically we take this different microorganism of interest, in this case lactobacillus, enterococcus, bifidobacteria, and pediococcus, particular strain, and then we grow them pretty much, and then in an in incubator with the MRS broth, I would guess, and then we centrifuge them, and we just collect the supernatant because we don't want to see the effect of bacteria. We just want to see whether the bacteria produce any antimicrobial compound and those antimicrobial compounds will be in the supernatant. And we take the supernatant and dilute it with, you know, like add it at multiple ratio with one unit, one amount, one constant amount of the pathogen. So zero, one will be the control group and see what is the growth of this pathogen, whether this supernatant is able to decrease the proliferation of the particular bacteria. It's not rocket science, but it will give me an idea whether to go ahead or not. Because in theory, every time a company comes up with, they have like hundreds of probiotic species. I need to narrow it down to four or five. So that's what we do. So this is the effect of free, self-free, self -free, meaning that no bacteria probiotic supernatant on terminal introduced in vitro proliferation. Uh, here is the control group that had no supernatant. Obviously, they were uh, doing uh, pretty good. But the groups that were given with uh, lack supplemented with supernatant, even at 1 is to 1 or even at 10 is to 1, meaning that at 10 is to 1 ratio, meaning for every 1 ml, I shouldn't be saying that, the supernatant has been diluted 10 times, still it is able to reduce the proliferation of salmonella entrides. All the bacteria we were studying, in fact, we started with more, all the bacteria we studied or decided to go with have was able to decrease the proliferation of salmonella entrides. Now, this is the same what we did earlier, but this time we did it with clostridial perfringence because we wanted to find whether these four, which we chose from hundreds, are efficient in not only in decreasing the proliferation of salmonella, but also in for clostridium perfringence. And we found that obviously when you know they are really really good uh, when you know like when they are given a tenfold, but as they get diluted, this is the more concentrated. This is diluted. Um, uh, when you dilute it, uh, you lose it, but still at a concentrated levels, uh, lactobacillus ruteri was efficient in decreasing clostridium perfringence. Obviously, animalis much was uh, much efficient, even at uh, one is to one. Uh, it was uh, at the, even at a diluted dose, uh, it was able to decrease the proliferation. So in this experiment, uh, we used just a supernatant, uh, and then we modified this particular experiment to see. The effect of not just the supernatant, but the bacteria itself. So we modified this where we plate the salmonella or the clostridium perfringens in a plate and then we drop the probiotic to see whether they are able to cause a colony or whether they are able to create a zone of inhibition. And as we were seeing, uh, some of the lactobacillus ruteri was able to create a beautiful zone of inhibition around it. Same with uh, uh, you bacteria and uh, I think uh, I forgot which one was it, but this was lactobacillus ruteri. Uh, I think this was uh, bifidobacteria animalis. So all bacteria they were pretty good uh, in decreasing the proliferation, creating an inhibiting inhibition zone around. Look at the inhibition zone in case of uh, 
uh, animals uh, we were able to see show that not only the supernatant but also the bacteria themselves uh, they can decrease uh, uh, the proliferation of uh, protein protein gets in vitro keep in mind this is an in vitro data and then there comes the question do they colonize the intestine this was one of the most complicated question i had ever tackled in my life because how do you find it a probiotic bacteria meaning that there's no marker so that means i cannot take this bacteria and then grow it and i cannot just grow lactobacillus i want the lactobacillus ruteri so if i feed lactobacillus ruteri how do you figure out that this lactobacillus ruteri survive the gut and then comes the question are we measuring the feed bacteria that we are just feeding or the true colonization of the bacteria meaning the bacteria goes to the intestine sets up a tent in the gut and then are we measuring that so we standardized a qpcr i just you know just it has been 3 years i published in uh, uh, poultry science this article where we standardized everything to quantify the uh, the amount of bacteria that survives the gut it was not as simple as you would think because let me say that there are 10 to the power of 14 bacteria and you have 1000 bacteria how are you how how can you find a technique that is sensitive enough to find 0.000001% of the population that's the problem so what we did was we fed bird for probiotic for 18 days and we stopped feeding probiotic for 72 hours at which point i would expect all those feed bacteria would have gone through the gut and then we collect the samples and analyze for colonization so here is you know like after i uh, i have expressed the data in two ways one as the copy numbers per gram or the percent of the total bacteria in different parts of the gut as you would see you don't see any in the top at all but as you go along uh, somebody is saying that you are not able to hear me uh, hope it's only one problem the rest of you are able to hear me i guess it's single problem sir no problem okay it's audible sir okay thank you thank you um so you would see that Okay, you will see that the colonized the crop does not have any lactobacillus ruteri much, but as you go down the intestine, the numbers goes up uh, as uh, but as you look at the percentage of the total bacteria, uh, lactobacillus ruteri peaks in the ileum. On the other hand, if you look at Enterococcus faecium, the both the total numbers or as a percentage of total bacteria they peak in the ileum but obviously you know let me go back to my previous slide uh, obviously they don't have much of a population in zika and i said salmonella is a problem in a zika is a big problem that's why we have problem with salmonella and if you are going to use enterococcus pcm or lactobacillus ruteri good luck we are not going to be of great help but if you go to use acidophilococcus acidolactici you will see that you will see the okay i'm getting lot of disturbance okay uh, and uh, uh, because you will see that they are not only their total number but also the percentage as percentage of total bacteria the numbers are pretty stable in the down the down the gut and they can also for lactobacillus salivarius uh, their numbers are pretty good in the jejunum part of the part uh, compared to the last part in the uh, zika so putting in perspective uh, some of you might be thinking that uh, on an average i am seeing that probiotics are present at what 0.05 percentage of the total bacteria is that even a good number does it even make sense but keep in mind total bacteria in 1 g of the zecal content is approximately 14 lot give or give or take few lots so if you are going to look at 0.05% of 14 log you are talking about 12 log unit this is lot of probiotics 
So for salmonella infection models, normally if I want to induce salmonella in my birds, I use around nine logs units per bird. So if I'm oh, salmonella, nine logs of salmonella. So in theory, if I have 12 logs of probiotics, obviously that with the idea to decrease salmonella, I would say that salmonella does not have a chance against my probiotic. So even though if the numbers are so low, 0.05%, if it's point even 0.005%, still I have a much better chance of trying to get rid of the salmonella. So what we do is next is the in vivo trial. What we did was, uh, this is, uh, uh, we used the probiotics, all the probiotics together. There are more than one group we had. So try to avoid, you know, you don't have to look at the phytogenic. Here is the control group that had no treatment. Virginia mycin is one of the antibiotic we used to control salmonella in the US. We use it a lot. At least we used to do that a lot, not anymore because of the veterinary feed directive. Uh, so what you would see that, as you start at three days post infection, the sun, the, the loads are pretty low in the Virginia mycin or the antibiotic group. But the birds that are supplemented with symbiotic, I use the word symbiotic, it is same as probiotic, but it's symbiotic because we use certain prebiotics in addition to probiotic, so I call that symbiotic. So here is the group and it can decrease the proliferation. It showed that it decreased the load of salmonella in the sea calf. And uh, at seven days, uh, same story. At uh, 21 days post infection, the symbiotic groups or the probiotic supplemented group uh, had a very similar load in the Zika. But uh, at the end of the day, the most important question is uh, who cares? What is the load of this uh, salmonella in the Zika? Who cares? Because chickens don't, to be, as I said earlier, it really doesn't matter what is the load of the salmonella in the sea because chickens don't have symptoms of salmonella. They don't care. Put more salmonella, they don't care. The only question that is comes that is of interest is does the decreased sea load translates to a lower carcass load? For example, when I process the bird, will there be lower amount of salmonella in the carcass? And what we found was uh, we, you know, we used a low of uh, most probable number uh, for you know, for ML of the of the uh, solution or the fluid that is around the uh, carcass, and you would see that birds that were uh, supple that were supplemented with either the antibiotic or symbiotic, the, you know, let me put it this way: birds that were supplemented with symbiotic, the load in the sun the carcass was very similar to the one that we use antibiotics and then we also look at whether it has probiotic properties like uh, it can increase some uh, uh, anti salmonella specific bile IgA and we showed that birds that were supplemented with uh, symbiotic uh, had a higher amount of uh, immunoglobulin A in the birds uh, uh, that were supplemented with uh, probiotics. And we also looked at the effect of this uh, probiotic supplementation in the necrotic enteritis model, where we first, you know, where we first obviously we feed the birds with the symbiotics, and then we challenged the birds with the Imeria maxima. It is one of the cox coccidial uh, strain that is involved in necrotic enteritis, and then we challenged them with Clostridium perfringens to induce necrotic enteritis. I'm not going to show you, we measured all the data, what is the load of Clostridium perfringens. Uh, we looked at anti-IgA, we looked at every parameter, we looked for salmonella, but I'm going to show you only one of the data about the villi height and crypt depth, and we were showing that as you are inducing necrotic enteritis, uh, you would lose your villi height, meaning that a huge damage to your villa because uh, these are gut pathogens uh, producing toxin, very similar to cholera toxin. These toxin produced by clostrid imperfringens uh, is going to be, uh, they'll be killing those intestinal cells. Uh, but the birds that were fed symbiotic or probiotic uh, and challenged with necrotic enteritis, uh, their villi height were very similar to uh, the control.
control group that had uh, no necrotic enteritis. So these are uh, some of the things uh, we do. And we honestly think, and if my personal opinion is uh, probiotics, uh, this is how a probiotic should come to the market. Uh, there are multiple uh, species. Uh, we use more than one species. Uh, and uh, thousands of options. Uh, we narrow it down to four in our case. Uh, we make sure that the probiotics survive. Uh, probiotics survive the part. Uh, and the colonize the intestine and we ask the question whether it has the probiotic properties and we ask whether it's just one pathogen or general health we do uh, or all of the above so these are some of the questions we had to conclude i think it's 45 minutes i think right on time my goal was to give a 45 minute talk uh, multiple approaches we do multiple approaches uh, probiotics are efficient in uh, killing the pathogen, in killing or decreasing the intestinal loads of salmonella. Most of the data I showed was today with salmonella, but uh, we do have data uh, to show that it is pretty efficient against the Campylobacter and the Clostridium. They are pretty good, these probiotics. And uh, probiotics in combination with other control is the way to replace some antibiotic use in poultry. And uh, this is my uh, a little bit old picture, but uh, my wife, uh, some of you, I had her picture because some of you might know her because she's, uh, 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 she's also an alumni of Madras Veterinary College. Uh, and my boys, uh, uh, Roshan, the other one, the other one, Roshan, the other one, Gopal. Um, so I thought of uh, some of you might recognize her. And uh, with this, uh, uh, my graduate students, uh, I can't uh, done any of the work without them, so thanks for them. And my uh, PhD, sorry, my MS mentor, Tachirian, my PhD mentor, Kirk, and my postdoc mentor, Terry, and Mandu. And uh, they are, these are, those four people are the one who made me who I am today. So wherever you guys are, thank you. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So there are some questions. Uh, shall okay. I take one by one? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So there is uh, one question from Dr. Manish Kumar Singh. He want to ask, what is the efficacy of probiotics in mitigating adverse consequences caused by heat stress in broilers? So, may not be direct for example we use probiotics whether and then we claim everything that's why we do science unfortunately so one of the way what happened for example i don't know whether i had the slide or deleted it probably deleted it you know what maybe here it is so give me a minute i now have this slide okay here so if you are going to look at it there are certain environmental factors that are going to affect your gut microbiota for example, when there is stress, the heat stress is going to change your gut microbial population. For example, let me say that you are traveling to a third world country, you know, without naming any country. And normally when you go there, you take a probiotic because the stress of travel or a different food will change your gut microbes. So when there is a heat stress, this is going to change your gut microbial population and supplementing probiotic will keep the balance so that's how heat you no know, probiotics can help you with heat stress definitely we use probiotics to control heat stress the effect may not be direct meaning that the probiotic is not going to take away the direct effect of heat stress but rather it is going to Take care of some of the effect of the heat stress on that microbiota, if that helps. Okay, sir. Sir, there is again one question from Dr. Sujit Kumar. What is the impact of biotechnology in poultry nutrition? So, like, you know, there are tons, you know, like, but just I'm going to answer in terms of probiotics. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, uh, there are huge amount of research in engineering your uh, probiotic. For example, you can design your probiotic because biotechnology is so great these days. You can put an enzyme, for example, instead of going and buying the phytase, I'm sure every one of you using phytase in poultry production, it's an enzyme that we use to increase the phosphorus availability. You can engineer your probiotic to produce phytase, or you can engineer your probiotics to produce more interleukin 10. So there's huge amount of application and currently we are talking about designing a probiotic or a probiotic that can, that has a bacterio, bacteriosin that can decrease the growth of salmonella. But the biggest problem comes in approval. You know, like how do we get an approval? I've seen everybody uh, having you know, like patent, everybody is ready to go, but I don't think anybody got an approval to use these products in poultry production. That's where the problem comes. So that's where we are pretty much stuck. We need to, I think, we would need another 10 to 15 years of people thinking ahead. The same problem with GMOs, genetically modified organism in plant. Uh, we might have the same problem down the road. Answer the question. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, again, there is one question from Dr. Balaji Ambore. He want to ask, is there any age limitations for using probiotics in poultry or ruminants? So at least I can answer for poultry. These days, we are saying that goat add probiotics in the hatchery. Believe me or not. For example, when the chicks hatch in the hatchery, it takes approximately even 48 hours for them to come to the farm because they don't get removed at the same time. Uh, so what we are trying to do is add the uh, probiotics to the gel strips that, that we give it in the hatchery itself. The idea is it is much, much easier for us to go change the population of the gut when there's no bacteria to start with. On the other hand, if you want to, this comes to some of the colonization resistance topic I talked about earlier. If you want to change the gut microbial population of a 70 or 90 week old birds, layer birds, good luck. That's not going to happen. So this is some of the, so the earlier you go, much better. Same with ruminants. When the ruminants are born, they are not ruminants, right? When they are born, as you know. They don't have a room, you know, so theoretically they're not ruminants. So it's much better to use a probiotic as early as possible so that you start with a good, I use the word cedar, cedar population, like feed, cedar population. So the age of birds are, or the ruminants are extremely critical. The earlier you go, much better. As you go later, it's not that it won't pop off, it won't be possible but you need a higher dose and sustained feeding. So I would say that age is important. Try to go as early as possible. Sir, uh, there are two questions. I'm combining both the questions. What is the possible interaction between probiotics and antibiotics? And second, probiotics will replace antibiotics or not? Uh, let me answer the second question first, because that's what I do. Uh, we add antibiotics for a particular reason, okay? I will tell you that. We are not monsters. When a nutritionist add an antibiotic, we add it not because I want to make your life miserable. I add for a single reason, that it improves, improves the production. If somebody says that antibiotic does not improve production, they are lying, okay? So I would say that it does it. So we use antibiotic. Now I replay, we are trying to replace antibiotic. We don't use antibiotics at all in US. In Europe, same. Everybody is having a problem with necrotic enteritis. So what would happen? The cost of production goes up. To answer your question, this is the problem with the world. They want an antibiotic-free product, but guess what? 
you want it cheap that's the biggest problem you guys have you are having on the day the consumer mentality changes that i'm willing to pay more for the product i get i would be successful until then so it's not my problem it is the consumer problem that you need to be ready to pay more for a product that is antibiotic free that's the answer so until that happens i don't think probiotic will replace antibiotic because antibiotics are damn good in decreasing c deficiency Okay. Now coming to the first question, what is the interaction between probiotic and antibiotic? Uh, the interaction is uh, hopefully we are hoping. For example, when we use Virginia mycin, for example, when I use Virginia mycin to decrease uh, salmonella load, it will knock out. Uh, it's obviously this antibiotic will knock out some of the lactobacillus. Uh, but uh, the way we do it is we do a continuous feed of the probiotics. Uh, so that is the reason when you use an antibiotic, uh, we would be using a continuous supplementation of this uh, uh, probiotics with the goal that eventually we won't say the word, but we are hoping that this probiotic will kind of become resistant to this antibiotic of use uh, so that their population won't get, uh, won't get, uh, 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 will not get, uh, uh, will not be eliminated because of the antibiotic. But we don't want to say it out loud because uh, we don't want to be saying that, hey, our probiotic is resistant to uh, oxytetracycline. We don't want to be doing that right. So we want to be a little bit careful. But that's a big interaction, I would say. Okay, if I don't hear it, but I saw somebody asking a question. I just saw it popped up on the screen. Can you cause diarrhea uh, by over supplementation? Absolutely. Believe me or not, if you start taking too much of probiotics, you will end up having, you know, your body won't handle this. I will guarantee you that, that these, uh, these birds will uh, end up having diarrhea. I can guarantee you that. So that is a pretty much, you won't do not, uh, you don't want to uh, over supplement it. Uh, probably, I would say, don't go over 10 to the power of 8 or 10 to the power of 9 CFQ per kg of your feed. Okay, any other questions? I don't hear you. Anyone else? I hope you guys are hearing me. You guys are hearing me, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Any other questions? What are principles for selection of probiotics in poultry industry? It is from Dr. Manish Kumar Singh. Okay, I'm going to go to my slide. Uh, so these are the principles. Uh, one is uh, most make sure, you know, like uh, you are going to be using multiple species uh, and they obviously you have thousands of options. Uh, but the most important thing I ask is uh, whether the probiotic can survive the gut. Just because you are feeding the probiotic does not mean that it survives the gut. Not only survive the gut, it should colonize the intestine. And then what are the different probiotic properties we are looking for? Like does it increase the villi height and drift depth? Does it... Uh, improve the production parameters or whatever criteria you want. For example, I have seen people using probiotics to decrease or improve the feed conversion ratio or to improve, for example, your, your goal could be completely different that my goal is to decrease, I'm going to use the probiotic and, and can I use the probiotic to decrease the problems in the leg which you would think that's not even related you know the foot fat dermatitis you can use your own criteria so make sure your probiotics can do that and finally ask the question whether it targets the general health 
or just one pathogen or multiple pathogen or it can affect everything. So these are some of the criteria we use in poultry industry. But the most important is number one, that it decreased salmonella, that it decreased clostridium imperfringens, that it increased, uh, decreased campylobacter load uh, in the carcass, uh, and uh, that it improved the production performance. These are the four major criteria in poultry industry. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, there are again four to five questions are there, sir. But I will take uh, this as the last question from Dr. Siddha. The remaining question I will communicate to you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he is willing to ask, sir, uh, why you have restricted to only four bacteria while there are so many available as far as the probiotic development is concerned? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's like. Uh... I'm going to be, uh, you know, like my wife, hopefully she doesn't get mad. <laughs> I can have multiple wives, you know, like, uh, you know, so can I have 100 wives? So one wife is uh, like a headache, right? So the point is that I need to find a balance. Can I use 100? Can I use one? Okay. The problem of adding more and more and probiotic is uh, one is we have to do a lot of research. The other thing is, uh, we cannot, these probiotics need to be manufactured, they need to be protected, they need to be transported, the patent has to be bought. So it's extremely difficult to add, keep on adding more. So I think we have to find a balance between using too much and too little. And what people do is, because at the same time, the price, I cannot charge my customer more than two dollars that's the upper limit in uh, poultry industry my product cannot go this is the upper limit two dollars per ton of the feed so whatever product i'm going to make it cannot cost more than two dollars when i add to the ton of the feed so if we're going to keep on adding more probiotics which is good we can do that but it is not economical to do that and the companies are here to make money so that's the short answer yeah, thank you, sir. Sir, again, last uh, really very interesting question from Dr. Hari Krishnan. He wants while giving probiotics in drinking water. What precautions are to take? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question because uh, we just ran an experiment. Uh, people were adding probiotics when they had uh, they were adding a chlorine compound. I'm just uh, blanking out the name of the product. In fact, it's better than I blanked out because I don't want to say the name of the product anyway. Uh, that product, when we were adding this particular chlorinated uh, product uh, to clear the lines, the water lines, showed that it was killing the probiotic. So make sure you don't add any of these chlorine products, chlorine dioxide products, uh, that can will eventually kill your probiotics in the water. That's the number one. You might want to consider adding a stabilizer to your water like milk powder. This can stabilize the probiotic to a certain extent. Make sure you clean your lines uh, once in a while because when you add a stabilizer, uh, make sure you do that. Uh, some people, what they do is they add a marker, a dye, a colored dye to the water so that the, they can look at the tongue of the bird to see whether the bird did consume the, uh, consume the probiotic. And the most importantly, once in a while, take the water, make sure the probiotics is alive in your water. Make sure you sample your water. So these are some of the precautions you might want to do when you add probiotics to the water. Yeah. Sir, thank you, sir. There are again uh, four to five questions are there, sir. I will uh, collect that questions and uh, send it to you. Uh, yeah. And uh, then I will uh, post it on our ISBM group and other things. Sir, Great. before uh, leaving this, yeah, 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 sir. Sir, uh, I do request the office uh, bearers of uh, Zydus uh, Animal Healthcare, it means authorities, that they having uh, uh, some presentation. I request them for their uh, uh, product presentation and other thing. Dr. Sujit, sir. Yeah, hi. This is Dr. Sujit. Yeah, my colleague, Dr. Susim, is here. He will present. 
Yeah, please, please. So, I hope you can uh, see me. Yeah. So, I'll just, do it very fast. Uh, just, uh, just a minute, sir. Just a minute, sir. Uh, uh, right. We, half of Indian Society for Veteran Medicine, I welcome you all and uh, I request you to present uh, your portfolio regarding the product. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, just sharing my screen. Yeah, please. Hope you can see this. So this is uh, uh, before starting this, uh, you know, it's a brief presentation on what we are doing on uh, probiotic research. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Selvaraj because uh, uh, he has shared a great, great insights uh, on uh, selection model of uh, probiotics for poultry and uh, how to go about that. In fact, uh, it makes uh, the uh, presentation that uh, I'm going to do very easy. Because we have uh, been working on that uh, in a big way from last uh, two and a half years. So we call it a project microbiome innovation. What we're going to do is that we are trying to control the chicken gut by feeding them a set of microflora. So we are going to characterize and identify and screen this microflora beforehand. And we know what are the characteristics this microflora are having. And we would uh, feed the chicken gut from day one as uh, as early as possible and we know what kind of beneficial effects this uh, microflora or combination of strains that we have characterized uh, uh, on the chicken and uh, and from there the probiotic effects are exerted and it does benefit to the poultry production uh, in terms of uh, production improving the production indices so uh, just this is a brief discovery pathway that we had uh, uh, you know uh, completed so far and uh, still some of the works are continuing. Um, um, so it started with, uh, you know, screening uh, an isolation of uh, probiotic uh, strains uh, from commercial farms throughout India. We did basically from all, all over the India and uh, we isolated the crop, jejunum uh, and uh, ileum. And, uh, and basically we are looking for the probiotics which are heat stable. Uh, and uh, and uh, basically pellet stable. It is more uh, stringent than heat stable itself. And uh, uh, we had certain uh, characteristics that were used for screening. First was non-humolytic, as you can see in the left. In the right is the is the discovery pathway in brief. So we started uh, screening for the heat stable one. So sport farmers were our target. Then we screened for non-humolytic properties because as Dr. Silveraj was identifying certain characteristics of probiotic could do harm rather than producing good effects. So hemolysis is one of them. So uh, that, that should be non-hemolytic spore formers. And we also studied uh, uh, cytotoxicity, but the study is not completed. That is, that's why I'm not captured it here on cytotoxicity profile of the screen strains. Then we studied uh, uh, the uh, you know, phenotypes, uh, you know, like uh, in, uh, expression of NSPAs, like xylanase, vitaminase, gluconase, uh, amylase and surfactin. Surfactin is a protein. Basically, we were targeting the bacilli species, and uh, they are known to, you know, destroy the gram-positive uh, bacteria like Clostridium perfringens. Then, surfactin expression profile were correlated with the antiseptic property. Uh, the zone of universe study we again studied against Clostridium perfringens, E. coli, and Salmonella, and uh, we screened the strains step by step based on that. And all selected strains were then uh, finally confirmed through uh, further biochemical study, morphology, and 16S RNA sequencing. And uh, we are in a process to identify some of the novel sequence. We have identified some strains having some novel sequence, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, get the results soon. And field trials are in progress for identifying a novel novel formulation out of there. Already, we have an existing line of products. We have already introduced two strains. That we uh, know uh, here in the next slide, uh, two strains we have already in, uh, introduced in our existing line of products, and further seventy. So four hundred strains were isolated from chicken GI tract, out of which nineteen uh, were you know finally screened, and two were introduced in, uh, to our uh, existing line of products, and further seventy strains were uh, categorized uh, based on the traits uh, that were you know shown in the earlier or previous slide. And we are into phase two studies right now. So uh, with the two strains that are there in the product, uh, improval BFS and improval MS, we conducted several trials. And one would like to, you know, uh, show some of the, uh, you know, 
were done in uh, you know broiler and layer. In broiler, we did, uh, we know we've done we have done a trial on the uh, to see the effects of these probiotics uh, in combination these two strains that we identified on the production performance and intestinal histomorphology. The the work has been uh, the work has been published in uh, International Journal of Poultry Science. And um, we have shown that the body weight gain and other performance parameters were significantly improved um, at uh, different dosing levels. And uh, we correlated with one standard strain, uh, Bacillus subtilis PV6. And um, we shown uh, correlated the production parameters with the villa site and the creep depth as well. In commercial layer, our tri uh, the trial was done uh, to show if we can withdraw the NSPAs uh, with uh, these two strains. Those were bacilli strains. I cannot disclose uh, the strain because it's still in the sequencing data is in process. So, uh, but if they were bacilli, bacilli strains and uh, we done trial in bovine and as well as BV300 flock and wanted to see whether we can, uh, you know, withdraw uh, NSPAs like xylanase from the feed formulation and the energy deficit, uh, the bridge, the gap can be abridged with the probiotic. So in Bowen's trial that we uh, have done from 34 to you know 34 week to 56 week a period of 21 week we have shown that uh, the uh, the feed intake were normally uh, almost same uh, with slight higher feed intake in the NSPS group, uh, but when we combine the probiotic and NSPS as well as probiotic alone the feed intake tend to improve over a period of time, but there was a, a very high you know see the the bottom of you know, you can see the graph shows the production performance during the period of 34 week to 56 week. Uh, the probiotic uh, group had shown you know, uh, a tremendous consistency along with the probiotic plus NSPS group uh, in production performance, where we uh, uh, the production fluctuations were quite evident in the NSPS group. In BV300 uh, trial, uh, what we saw is that after withdrawal of uh, probiotic for a two weeks time, there was a drastic you know, reduction in the production performance and uh, dysbacteriosis and daily mortality also increased uh, within within next uh, two weeks time. We have many uh, further data on this particular trial, but due to shortage of you know uh, time, I could not uh, you know, capture those here. But overall, what we saw in this trial is that uh, when we replace the NSPS with the, uh, we use that. Which was abridged by the probiotic. And we found a cost saving of 60 to 90 rupees per metric ton of feed uh, by real of NSPS in the layered diet. So uh, this was a brief update of uh, the uh, project that we are running of selection of probiotics and, and, and uh, by inclusion of these two strains in the existing line of products, we could improve the performance of the existing products and further uh, strains are being tested and hopefully uh, uh, we'll be able to uh, you know, launch in the market soon. So thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, before uh, conclude this uh, webinar, I would like to request Dr. Nilesh for vote of thanks. Dr. Nilesh, please. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, respectively, Dr. Ramesh, sir, the speaker uh, today's webinar. Uh, our, our organizers, uh, Dr. Norial, uh, uh, Dr. Ram Prabhu, sir, uh, Dr. Galdar, sir, Dr. Shankar, sir, and all other esteemed audiences uh, of uh, this webinar. I'm very thankful to Dr. Ramesh, who uh, spared uh, his valuable time and gave us a valuable information. The information was wonderful and uh, uh, around 170 180 people uh, were listening till the end so this is the this is this indicates uh, that uh, uh, topic uh, chosen was very interesting and the speaker uh, uh, was very fine very good and uh, i am also thankful to all uh, all the uh, uh, 
team members of uh, uh, in, uh, all the team members of Jidas uh, Animal Health for their uh, uh, support and their sponsorship. Uh, and uh, their association will be uh, in long run with us. And I also uh, uh, thank you uh, all of you who have attended the webinar. And uh, thank you once and again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good night. <coughs> Please visit uh, our Facebook page of ISVM uh, for details of our next webinar that is scheduled on the 16th of uh, this month. Uh, uh, now back to Dr. Galdar, please. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Dr. Nilesh. Thank you very much. Uh, there is an announcement for all the participants. The certificates for this particular webinar will be issued in the time of 15 days, per time limit of 15 days. And I am again inviting all of you to join our next webinar. It's on 16th uh, August. And this uh, webinar topic is uh, really very wonderful, chosen by Executive Committee of Indian Society for Veterinary Medicine. It is nothing but pandemic preparedness, role of veterinarian. And it is going to be delivered by Dr. Sandeep Bhatia, Principal Scientist, ICR National Institute of High Security Animal Diseases, Bhopal, India. So I request all the participants to join that webinar also. Thank you. Hi, Ramesh. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, see you. Thank you, thank you, see you. Yeah. See you, Mr. Bye, guys. Huh? It's nice.